Yeah! Hey, guess what all this stuff's for? I've decided to grill my own lunch. An egg salad sandwich with tomatoes and lettuce. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what a farmer's supposed to wear or what a farmer's supposed to use. Anyway, why am I growing my own lunch? To answer Sarah's question. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? Good question. That makes me wonder, where does food come from in the first place? Like, where would I get spaghetti from? A noodle tree? That doesn't sound right. But everything you get from the grocery stores, including junk food, like mm. chips, donuts, or hot dogs, have to be made from stuff that was grown by a farmer somewhere. <laughs> What would we do if we couldn't get food from grocery stores? Would we grow it ourselves? I'm gonna give it a try. And by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to Sarah's question. But first, Brenna has a question that takes us right back to the beginning of it all. Who invented food? Ooh, berries look delicious, but me not know if they are poison. Ooh, me have idea. Watch animals and see which berries they eat. Ooh, monkey is eating berries. He seems okay. Now me eat berries. Hmm, yummy. Berries are poisonous. For me, too many. Tummy ache. <laughs> Ancient humans may have figured out what foods were safe to eat by watching animals and copying them. But it wasn't always the best idea because some animals eat things that can make people sick. Then about 8,500 years ago, someone had a crazy idea to collect seeds and plant them in the ground and see if they would grow. And they did. <laughs> I found out it was the very beginning of farming and it changed everything because people didn't have to wander around looking for food. They could start villages. As people discovered how to grow new foods, they started to trade with other villages. Soon, everyone had a lot of different kinds of foods to eat. Now, for my egg salad sandwich, I'll definitely need some eggs. I just have to find some chickens. But first, here's a great chicken question from Vanessa. Why do chickens lay different colored eggs? Because I've seen brown eggs and white eggs. That's a tough egg to crack, Vanessa. But I have some experts who can answer your question. Please welcome chicken farmers, Kate Belwick and her son, Fletcher. Hey Zoe, I heard you needed some egg layers for your sandwich. You brought chickens? Hi chickens. You don't have to eat chicken around me. This is so exciting. Get it? Mm -hmm. Exciting. So do you often lend chickens to people? We do, we actually rent chickens to people who want to have their own freshly laid eggs all summer. This is awesome, can I name them? Yes, it's okay for you to name them. We let everyone name them. Oh boy, I'll name that one Molly, uh, that one Princess Pumpernickel, that one Pipsqueak, and that one Cluffy. So why do chickens lay different colored eggs? In the beginning, all eggs are white inside the chicken and different breeds will lay down a different color or a pigment in the last few hours before they're laid. These three chickens here lay brown eggs and the chicken over there, she will lay blue eggs. If you get a cross between the brown egg layers and the blue egg layers, you can get a green egg from them. Green eggs? Is that where green eggs and ham come from? <laughs> so are blue eggs blue inside? <laughs> actually, no, they're all the same inside the shell. So what do they eat? Well, they actually eat this grain food. It's just a mix of grains all crumbled up. So how you feed them is you just get a bit of food and you can sprinkle it on the ground and they'll eventually eat it. How long does it take for them to lay eggs? A couple weeks? No, not even close. They'll all lay one egg a day, starting right away. That means I'm gonna have four eggs today. I hope you like omelets. Four eggs a day? That's 28 eggs a week. And then I'll have 112 eggs a month. And then I'll have 1,344 eggs a year. That means I'll have 600 and Oh, 
I'm gonna have to get cracking. I'm gonna have to get laying, crack. Thanks for lending me your chickens, guys. I'll take excellent care of them. No problem, Zoe. We know you'll be an exceptional <laughs> chicken handler. <laughs> Pumpernickel, such beauties. Ask a friend. Hey guys, what are your favorite foods that are made with eggs? Eggs with toast. Hot boiled eggs. An egg sandwich. Egg salad and tuna sandwich. Cake. Omelets because they taste really good. Pancakes. I like an over easy, some bacon on the side. Egg sandwich and egg salad. Egg sandwich, but with like ketchup and uh, broccoli. Hmm, I'll try that. Now, what else do I need for my sandwich besides eggs? Oh yeah, bread. I actually got a question about bread. Where does bread come from? That gives me a great idea for... Today we're playing What's That Food Made From? Melissa, Kiara, your team Munch. Yeah. Yay! Daniele, Andrea, your team Crunch. Yeah! Each team will have to match up each of the familiar foods over here on the tables with the plant or animal that they're made from. Over there. Let's pull noodles to see who goes first. Okay, Munch, you guys are going first. Get matching. So do we take the chocolate first? Um, where did it go? There? Those look yeah, like, I think sort of it goes look like cocoa beans. Oh, there. <laughs> That's right. Chocolate is made by roasting the beads from inside this weird looking cocoa plant pod. Team Crunch, go. Team Crunch selected the popcorn and they're matching it with the corn. And they're right. Heat up dried <laughs> corn kernels and they become popcorn. This what should go. The cinnamon sticks. I think it goes there. Okay. They're matching the cinnamon sticks with the sugar cane. And that's not right. A lollipop. Team Crunch is matching the lollipop with the sugar cane. That's right. Lollipops are mostly made of sugar, which is made by boiling this tall grass called sugar cane. Bread, maybe? Okay. Yeah, it goes here. Peanut butter should go in. That's right, peanut butter is made with peanuts, which grows underground on the roots of the peanut plant. Cheese. I'm sure it goes with the cow. <laughs> yeah. That was an easy one. Cheese. Real easy. I think the maple syrup is from a tree. That one or that one? Okay. Maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right. It's right. Maple syrup is made with the sap of the maple tree, which gets boiled down to become thick and sugary. Team Crunch is putting their chocolate in front of the cinnamon tree. Nope. A lollipop. Put it there. And Team Munch also gets the cinnamon tree wrong. Agdas, here's the answer to your question. Where does bread come from? Both teams put their bread in front of the wheat. And they're right. Wheat seeds are ground up to make flour, which is the main ingredient in bread. Salt, um, maybe. Ocean is salty. Okay, put it there. I think it's wrong. <laughs> Actually, that's right. Most salt comes from ocean water. Sea salt. Peanut butter. Butter, where does that go? It has peanuts. peanuts. Yeah. The cinnamon sticks. Oh, oh no. We should have switched. That's right, because cinnamon is made from the bark of the cinnamon tree. Let's put it here. Mmm, okay. french fries. Um, with the potato. <laughs> That's another easy one. French fries. Popcorn. Pop with corn, because it's like popcorn. popcorn. <laughs> That's the last thing. <laughs> Maple syrup, it comes from a tree, so it makes sense. Okay, you guys are done. Team Munch, you have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! And Team Crunch, you also have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! So it's a tie. Thanks for playing. What's that <laughs> Now, let's not all let this go to waste. Come on. I want the car. I want the chocolate. The chocolate. I want the pop. Take a good look at that sandwich. Or at that bubble gum. Do you wonder what they're made of? Where did they come from? We can't have bread without ground up wheat. Gum used to be made with rubber from this tree. Such a chewy treat. See those fish sticks on your plate. They're made from having solar card. That candy 
cheese floss is made with yak hair. All balls up into a wad. What? It's made of sugar? Oh! Well, if you're ever feeding and wondering what you're eating, come sing this song with me. How is ketchup invented? Who doesn't love ketchup? So I checked, and it's made with squished tomatoes, sugar, vinegar, and it goes with everything. But the first ketchup invented didn't taste anything like this stuff. I found out that it was made from mushrooms, walnuts, oysters, or little fish called anchovies. Yummy. Luckily, a scientist named James Meese introduced tomatoes in his new ketchup recipe, and the rest is history. We make tons of good sauces out of tomatoes, but they didn't always have such a good reputation. Deadly and horrible tomato! Save yourself and your children from this stinky, poisonous devil fruit. It was brought to Europe by foolish travelers. Whatever you do, don't eat them, or you will die a horrible death. Instead, try a safe and healthy fruit, like this apple. Oh! Elijah Mario! Ah! The end is near! Ah! For over 200 years, people in Europe were afraid of tomatoes? That was thanks to a British barber, surgeon, and scientist named John Gerard. He described tomatoes as stinking and being poisonous, and everyone believed him. This myth began because people ate tomatoes on plates made of a metal called pewter and got really sick. But it wasn't the tomatoes' fault. There was a poisonous chemical in the pewter called lead that seeped into the tomatoes. It's too bad for so long Europeans were missing out. Imagine spaghetti and meatballs without the tomato sauce. It's just not the same. You guys are the messiest roommates ever. Look at this place. You know, if we lived in a world without grocery stores, you might think you could get your food directly from farmers. Well, it might not be that easy because a whole lot of the food we get from grocery stores comes from all around the world. So the next time you're at the store, look close at the label and it will show you where in the world it comes from. See, this pair says it's from South Africa. That's way down here. This garlic comes from China. And these grapes were grown in Mexico. Check out your fruits and vegetables at home. See which ones are grown close to where you live. Hey. Woohoo! Y'all hey. huh? ain't from around here, are ya? Now, here's a question from Alyssa. Can you grow food in the city? To answer Alyssa's question, I'm meeting Nicholas Taylor plant science manager who works at a farm. Uh, where's the farm? These are just big old factory buildings. Hey, hey Zoe, Zoe. Zoe. I'm, I'm up, up here. here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Nicholas. Hey, welcome to Lufa Farms, the world's first commercial rooftop greenhouse. Whoa, you really can grow food in the city. But what is your farm doing on the roof? Good question. What happens is more and more people are filling up all the spaces around the cities and we're running out of land. What we did was rather than to have a farm outside the city far away where we'd have to bring the food in, we brought the farm right into the city. Now, because there's so many buildings, they decided to use areas that were not being used by the people, which is on top of the roofs. What's cool about being on top of a roof is that you capture all that sun that would normally be hitting the roof, but now it's hitting the cucumbers and helping them grow. Here's one of our uh, Lebanese cucumbers. Want to try it? You mean pick it off the tree? Yeah, go for it. Without washing it? You don't have to. We don't use any synthetic pesticides here. Oh, no poisonous chemicals to kill the bugs? Cool. Mm, that 
That's really good. When you grow veggies really close to where the people are picking it up, you can pick it as fresh as possible. So it's super good and packed with nutrients. So when food has to travel a long time to get here, it loses its flavor. Absolutely. And Nicholas tells me that when food travels far to get to us, a lot of it spoils and is wasted. And also, that transporting it means burning a lot of fuel. That causes pollution. Hey, can I help you plant something? Want to plant some lettuce? Sure. All right, let's do it. So we're going to be planting some butterhead lettuce. They're probably getting a little angry sitting in this tray because we probably should have planted them a couple days ago. So what's cool about this system is that we can grow a lot of lettuce really close together super efficiently. Look, a little bug. That reminds me of a question that I got from Amber. Is bug poison on plants bad for people? In farms, people can use a lot of bug poison in the form of pesticides. And it has been shown to be kind of rough for people, which is why most people will suggest that you always wash your fruits and veggies. But we don't use any synthetic pesticides here. So we fight bugs with bugs. Right here in front of us, we have a lot of bad guy bugs called aphids. They're eating our peppers. One aphid in about one day can make 10 more aphids. And then those 10 make 10, and then those 10 make another 10, <laughs> and then the plant is just completely covered. So what we use to fight these bugs is more bugs. What? In this case, Whoa, ladybugs. That's right. <laughs> but these guys, they're not gonna harm us. They're not interested in me at all. If anything, <laughs> if anything they're probably confused about my arm hair. Whoa. So they're gonna crawl around and they're gonna look for these aphids on these leaves. It tickles. <laughs> Ladybug, high five. Yeah. Are you ready? No, I'm good. No, you're gonna squish them. <laughs> so all these guys are gonna hang out here <laughs> because this is the best place in town for ladybugs. Yeah, because they eat the aphids. It's eating one now. That's right, but they don't just eat aphids. They eat all sorts of other little pests. They're kind of like the big boss compared to all the other bugs. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. They're so small. They don't have a tough name, yeah. but they're one of the toughest species we have. Hey, you want to put that out? Sure. That's it, perfect. Good job, little ladybug. The sweet pepper, want to pick it? Sure. <laughs> there you go. Vegetables you can eat the same day they were picked. From a farm in the city on a rooftop. Thanks, Nicholas. This is so exciting. I have fresh vegetables now, and with the eggs from the chicken, my lunch is really starting to come together. But you don't have to get someone else to grow your veggies. You can grow them yourself by planting seeds in your backyard garden or in window boxes. You can even grow new veggies from old leftovers. My friends tried it out. The experiment! And Elaine and Vivian found out that you can grow fresh vegetables from kitchen scraps like these. What are you doing? I'm gonna try and put this piece of celery in water and see what happens. You take the bottom part from a celery bunch and sit it in some warm water in the sun. Let's wait a couple of weeks and see what happens. Okay. It grows new leaves. Take the sprouting celery and plant it in some earth. Try taking the seeds from inside a pepper plant. Plant them in soil and give them a little bit of water. Put your pots in the sun and wait for a couple of weeks. Look it up. You can do this with many kinds of veggies. I can't believe this worked. I know. So there you go. Plant your table scraps and have your own indoor mini farm. Now that's local produce. Bye, Zoe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> These veggies have had some time to grow. And look at them now. Looks like I can add some celery to my egg salad. That means I have everything I need to make a sandwich. And I can finally answer the question that started off the show. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? The big answer is... We can grow it ourselves or buy it from local farmers. In fact, it looks like we'll be doing this more and more in the future. Growing food close to home can help avoid some big problems, like waste, poisonous pesticides, and air pollution. Plus, 
the food is healthier and tastes way better. That rooftop farm I visited is just one amazing way to grow food in the city. There are kids planting gardens in their school yards, and community food gardens are popping up all over the place. People have even turned swimming pools into fish farms. It's amazing what you can grow if you get creative. Now all I have to do is make my sandwich. Well, I forgot to grow wheat to make bread. Good thing my mom picked up a loaf of bread from the local farmer's market. That still kind of counts, right? This is the best homegrown sandwich I've ever eaten. Princess Pumpernickel. Clucky, your eggs are delicious. Great job, guys. Thanks, Holly. Welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where you send in your questions and I find out the answers. Here's the first question. Oops, sorry about that. Here's the first question. It's from... This is embarrassing. My mom's making my favorite meal tonight. Lasagna. I know you can't smell it, but I can. And it's driving me crazy. Would you let me finish? Here's the first question from Yayata. Why do we have to eat? The short answer is... Person, dinner will be ready in 20 minutes. Because our parents say we have to. Okay, Mom. But I guess that's not the answer that you're looking for, or the one that Sora is looking for. How long can you go without eating? Maybe it depends on whether it's nothing or this, a sardine sundae. <laughs> okay, I don't know why we eat or how long we can go without eating, but by the end of the show, I'll find out the answer to those questions and other stuff about food and nutrition, like... Why do we have a tongue? <laughs> well, I know that we need it for speaking and it's useful for sealing envelopes. Speaking of tongues, that reminds me of a really fun test you can do. Try sticking out your tongue and touching your nose at the same time. If you can do it, that means you're really smart. Try it now. These guys can do it. Are you doing it? Were you able to do it? Here, watch me. I bet you didn't see that coming. <laughs> Anyway, I checked, and besides helping us speak, lick envelopes, and make jokes, our tongue is an important part of how we and other creatures eat. For some animals, especially ones that don't have hands, their tongues let them hang onto their food. And it works for us, too. Our tongues are covered in tiny, nubbly thingies that scientists call papillae. They help us grip our food. Some of those papillae contain taste buds, which can sense different tastes, such as sweet, salty, bitter, or sour. And that leads to our next question. Why do girls have more taste buds than boys? La, 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 la. Duh, girls have more taste buds than boys do, so I can enjoy this lovely lollipop more than a boy can. Mm. Who says girls have more taste buds? I think boys do. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, they're both wrong. There was a recent study done in Denmark. That's the country where Vikings came from long ago. And it shows that there's no real difference in the number of taste buds that boys and girls have. But there is a difference in the way boys and girls taste. Boys and girls both taste good to me. Excuse me. I didn't mean as in eating boys and girls. I meant how boys and girls judge taste differently than each other. Hey, what's he doing here? Get your own show. Yeah! Now, where was I? Oh, right. Girls can taste both sweet and sour better than boys can. <laughs> so a lemon would taste more sour to a girl, but an ice cream cone would taste sweeter. Mmm, tasty. Need some sweetening. Much better. And speaking of taste, here's a question from Justin. Why does junk food taste so good? Mm, interesting question. Oh, the sacrifices I make for science. Person? Yes, Mom? 
Don't spoil your appetite. Okay, Mom. How do parents know what you're thinking of doing before you even think it? That's a good question for finding stuff out. As for junk food, the reason it tastes so good is because of all the salt, sugar, and fat they put in it. This calls for a dietitian. She knows about the things we eat, the ones that are salty and the ones that are sweet. Here's Joelle Limon. Oh, junk food, my favorite. And yes, it's all junk. <laughs> Why is junk food called junk food? Junk food, well, if you think of the word junk, what comes to your mind? Uh, garbage or like just, just junk. Something you know? useless, yeah, right? Yeah, something useless. Well, that's the same for junk food. It means it brings to your body nothing useful. Let's okay. say you take that donut, for example. Right. A donut like this contains about one teaspoon of fat and eight sugar cubes. All that plate is the amount you need in a day. So we're only supposed to eat this much fat and sugar in a day. Yeah, so a donut would be like a quarter of your needs and sugar. So that's a lot. What about a muffin? It's similar to a donut in some ways. Is that healthier? You're in for a big surprise. If it's a commercial muffin, let's yeah. say, it, where it's actually almost two donuts, sometimes more. What? Yeah. That's it's really crazy. hard to tell just by looking at the food. I'll make a comparison with healthy food for you. Okay. If you take those seven strawberries, mm -hmm. you have enough vitamin C, that you need in a day to keep your tea and gums healthy. You get only two sugar cubes. And how much fat? None. No Surprise, fat? Surprise, no fat. Wow, so potato chips are my favorite junk food. So how do those compare to the strawberries? To get exactly the same amount of vitamin C from potato chips, yeah. you would need to eat six small bags. They actually contain 27 teaspoons of fat and all that sugar. That's a big bag it's of potato chips. It's more than what you need in a day. Well, I guess I should lay off the potato chips a bit then. Yeah, that's <laughs> what junk food is. So how do kids know what is good to eat and what is bad? The food companies, they put food labels on the package. Right. So you get to know how much fat and how much sugar and how much of the other nutrients that there is in the food. Well, thanks for helping me out with all this junk food it stuff. It was a pleasure. Will you come back for my great challenge? Sure. Well, now I know why they call it junk food, but to find out why that bad stuff tastes so good. I'm here at Nova Taste, where they make flavors for all kinds of food and drinks. And this is Dr. Luke Haffenden, who's a food scientist. Hi, Harrison. Hi, sounds like a cool job. Can you launch bacon into outer space? Of course not, but we can make about anything taste like bacon. You can make a bacon beverage, bacon bubble gum, bacon candy, bacon cookies, even come up with a bacon perfume. Huh. Here, try this. It's bacon flavored popcorn. Mmm, it does taste like real bacon. So junk food has a lot of fat, sugar, and salt in it. But did you know food companies add flavors to make it taste better? Wow, are all of these flavors? Yes, they are. There's millions of different flavors that we can come up with because there's about 13,000 ingredients that we can use. Here, have a smell. Mmm, root beer. Here, you can smell it too. All flavors are made with chemicals. Oh, this is good. This smells like bubble gum. In natural flavors, those chemicals come from plants or animals. <laughs> This is an ingredient that's found in coffee. We actually use it to make coffee flavors, but it's interesting to know that it's also found in skunk spray. It's terrible. In artificial flavors, scientists make the chemicals in a lab, often from things we don't normally eat, like petroleum or wood. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, what is that? That's an onion essential oil. That is so bad. Food scientists are also starting to use the flavors they create to make junk foods, well, less junky for you. That's pineapple. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make you taste two great beverages. One has a lot less sugar than the other. Okay. Can you tell the difference? No, no, no. Good. No, no, no. This one has less sugar. No. No, this one has less sugar? Absolutely. They both tasted exactly the same. Exactly. Here, have one. Okay. Mmm, these are good. Well, what you're tasting here is a peanut butter and chocolate cupcake where 
we've actually not even used any peanuts because we're not allowed to have peanuts here. There's 50% of the cocoa that's been removed and 50% of the sugar. Wow, because of the flavors they added, they were able to use less sugar and fat. And the cupcakes still taste yummy. So now it's time to test out some kids with this healthy grape drink, this horribly smelly onion drink, and this weird potato chip drink that I'm making. <laughs> Let's get some. Well, now it's time for the taste test. Yeah! And they'll be doing it one by one. Okay, let's try number one first. Mm, grape. Grape. Bubble gum. Grape. Grape. It tastes like grape. Okay, now let's move on to number two. Water. 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 It's just water. Water? And let's move on to number three. Ew. <laughs> it's disgusting. It tastes like fish. <laughs> Weird taste. <laughs> Chicken mixed with milk. Squish Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> so, how can you explain these results? First of all, when you look at the potato chip drink, mm -hmm. it's not a flavor that you would typically associate with a beverage. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no one that was expecting it, and that's more or less why people were only picking out the salt and the fatty flavors, yeah. and they couldn't really put their finger on it or right. their nose. <laughs> and for the second example, which was the onion drink, mm -hmm. well, as soon as you opened up the bottle, the aroma came out and filled the room. Right. And since taste is 90% smell, Okay your nose was saturated with that onion smell, so you couldn't really taste it properly. Right. As for the grape beverage, right. grape tends to be one of the most popular flavors for kids. Yeah. So that's why, even though there was no purple color, uh -huh. a lot of the kids were able to pick it up properly. Mm -hmm. And it was a healthy version. And I'm glad that, just like you, yeah. the kids liked it. Yeah, well, thanks for taking me on this smelly experience. Well, it can get smellier, so anytime. <laughs> How do we know we're hungry? That question is just eating away at me. And that gives me a good idea for cooking up today's special. Uh-oh, dude, try this at home. Watch the screen carefully and listen too. Ready? Is your mouth watering? That's one of the body's ways of preparing us to eat because the saliva helps break down our food. But guess what? It's a trick. If you salivated, it's because the sounds and pictures triggered a pleasure center in your brain. Dogs salivate when they see food. Ah. As an experiment, a scientist named Pavlov rang a bell every time he fed dogs in his research lab. Ah. The dogs got so used to hearing a bell ring every time they got fed, that eventually, Pavlov could make the dogs drool just by ringing the bell, without giving them any food. That's why restaurant commercials can make us feel like we want food, even when we're not hungry. Why does my stomach crumble? Well, Gigi, I found out that our stomachs always rumble. It's the sound of our muscles in our digestive system, contracting or squeezing. It's just that if there's food down there, it muffles the sound so you can't hear it. But if your stomach is empty, you can hear it. But some people didn't always think we need food down there. What is the food of the future? The Flat Earth Corner. We, food scientists of the past, are making the food of the future. That's why I'm wearing this futuristic outfit, because by the year 2000, everybody will dress like this. And here's what they'll be eating. Future food will be highly processed, better in every way than silly old-fashioned food. Ugh, who needs apples or bananas or carrots or cereal or mangoes or bread? Ugh, that's for the garbage. In the future, who but a raccoon would want that when we've got these food pills? 
Just one of these three times a day will supply you with all the nutrition you need. No more inconvenient toast, time-consuming cheese, or pesky vegetables. By not having to eat, you'll have lots more time to do more important things. Like your homework. Sounds good, doesn't it? Over a hundred years ago, some food scientists thought that we could just take pills full of nutrients and not have to eat actual food at all. But nowadays, we know that the human body wasn't designed to just live on nutrient pills. Yum, yum. Would you like some lukewarm simulated chicken? We have a huge digestive system inside us. We need bulk and fiber to keep our insides healthy. Stuff like this. And anyway, food tastes good, so the food of the future will probably be a lot like the food of today. Speaking of digesting, here's a question from Priscilla. What happens to your food after you eat it? First of all, there's a bunch of tubes inside you that process your food. They're called intestines. They're about this big. And guess what? There's this much inside of you. And what your body does with it is incredible. What happens to our food? Well, if it tastes good, first we chew, then we swallow. Down to our stomach, where it's hollow. Enzymes there, break it down. When they're done, it gets passed around to the small intestine, seven meters long, takes nutrients out to make us strong. The large intestine absorbs the water, just like a giant paper blotter. And that, my peeps, is the scoop. And what we can't use turns into poop. Yeah, what we can't use turns into poop. Today, my challengers are Genevieve. Hey. And Kyle. Yeah. And I've also brought back my expert dietitian, Joelle. Yay. So, Genevieve, what is your favorite lunch? My favorite lunch is green cheese sandwich, corn chip with salsa, apple juice, and chocolate cake. And Kyle, what is your favorite lunch? Bacon and sausage pizza with peppermint ice cream and vanilla smoothie. So today's challenge is to guess how much lard and how much sugar is in your favorite lunches. So are you guys ready? Yeah. Go. Al just goes right in and grabs a handful. <laughs> <laughs> Al's done. done. Okay, so now it's time to get your results. Genevieve, what are yours? Nine fat and 30 sugar. Your meal actually contains eight teaspoons of fat and about 31 sugar cubes. So you're Ooh, very close. close. Congratulations. And Kyle, what are your results? Five fat, 42 sugar. So for this meal, it should actually be 10 fat, so it's double the amount that you guessed, and 21 sugar cubes. <laughs> Looks like Genevieve was closer on this one. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Genevieve might have won this round, but both of their meals were losers. Remember, this is the most fat and sugar you're supposed to have in one day. Genevieve's favorite meal by itself contains half the fat and nearly all the sugar. Kyle is not doing much better with his lunch. It contains two-thirds of the fat and sugar he needs in a single day. Wow. Well, that's... that's impressive. That, eh? that is a lot. Kyle, how about going from this to this? Instead of your fatty and sugary lunch, you could enjoy a pizza pita pocket with veggies and cheese, a soy beverage, and half a cup of chocolate frozen yogurt. You like it? Yeah. Yay. And Genevieve, how about going from this to this? Forget all that sugar and fat, and check out this makeover lunch. A grilled cheese sandwich stuffed with salsa, fruits, veggies, almonds, and even some chocolate chips with a small apple juice. Does it look good? Yeah. It looks good, eh? <laughs> it looks amazing. You're staring at it. <laughs> so next one we'll be doing is a fast food meal. Go. <laughs> okay, Genevieve, what do you have? I have 10 fat and 25 sugar. Kyle, how did you do? 9 mm. fat, 27 sugar. It actually contains 11 teaspoons of fat and 49 sugar cubes. Wow. And that's why we tend to gain weight whenever we go too often to fast food restaurants. <laughs>
So Kyle, you were closer in the sugar, and Geneviève was closer on the fat. Mm -hmm. So it's a tie for this round. <laughs> All right, so next one we'll be doing is a snack. It's a yogurt strawberry granola bar and a strawberry kiwi cocktail. And go. go. This looks like a healthy snack, eh? What yeah, do you think? It doesn't look bad. So, Geneviève, what do you have? Three mm. fat and 12 sugar. And Kyle? Mm. Two fat, 17 sugar. And the winner is? I think Kyle was a it's lot closer. It's Kyle. <laughs> it seems like a healthy meal, but it's yeah. full of sugar because it's processed food and cocktail juice. So it was one teaspoon of fat and 22 sugar cubes. It's almost all the sugar you need in a day. It's impressive, eh? That's crazy. And the winner is? Nobody, it's a tie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, before you guys leave, I have a prize for you. We got carrots. Woo! Yay! <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it's time to answer the questions that started me off on this calorie-reduced but tasty quest. How long can you go without eating? Why do we have to eat? Big answer is... To live. So, Yayata, we need food for our bodies to grow and repair themselves and give us energy. Without food, we just couldn't exist. And we couldn't play outside. So to answer your question, Sarah, scientists have found out that we can go without eating for four to six weeks. Harrison, dinner's ready! Lasagna, yes! My favorite, gotta go. I'm having a party later today. My friend Erica and I share the same birthday, so we're having a double birthday party. But first, I'm going to Erica's house to bake the most awesome cake ever. And maybe even do more because of this question from Maya. What type of experiments can you do in your kitchen? Well, Maya, I definitely think baking is an experiment, especially if you're making something for your first time. This was supposed to be a fluffy cake, but I ended up with this mess. But I'll get the answer to your question by the end of the show. And plus, Erica is a winner of a TV cooking show, so our cake, I mean experiment, is going to be awesome. <laughs> Hi, Erica. Hi, Zoe. Look what I brought. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Erica, do you think cooking is like an experiment? Cooking is exactly like an experiment. You follow a recipe and see regular ingredients transform into something totally different. So first, we're going to start with the sugar, so you can add this to the flour. OK. Our tasty experiment uses dry ingredients, like baking soda and baking powder. Wow. Then the wet stuff. <laughs> Good? Yeah. Put it all together and mix it up. So now we have to add the thing that makes this normal vanilla cake a funfetti cake. So the sprinkles. <laughs> it looks so fun. This is going to be one tasty cake, once it turns into a cake, that is. <laughs> Which reminds me of a question I got from Adriana. What makes a cake rise? It says magic on the box, but it's not really magic powder, right? No, it's not magic, it's science. It works with the baking soda to create little bubbles of gas. Cool. Both baking powder and baking soda create a cool chemical reaction. It's kind of like when you mix baking soda and vinegar. Watch that chemistry in action. It creates little bubbles of gas. That's what makes our cake rise. Once we add the baking soda to the cake mix, we have to put it in the oven right away. That reminds me of an experiment my friends did. It uses baking soda, too. The experiment! Hi, Raphael and Amber. Hi, Hi Zoe. So what are you cooking up in your experiment? It's a secret. We mix baking soda and water in a bowl. Now we could draw something on the paper. 
Are you guys sure about this experiment? I don't see anything. You're not supposed to. Not yet. Oh, I see. It's like invisible ink. Yes. We just have to let it dry. Now we paint lemon juice over our paper. The lemon is acidic and it reacts to the baking soda. And it makes our invisible ink appear. Oh, yeah. This is pretty cool. I see it now. Happy birthday, Zoe! <laughs> that chemical reaction was kind of like the way baking soda reacts with the acidity in our cake mix. It was important to add the right amount of baking soda and baking powder to our cake, or else it wouldn't rise properly. When my family and I cook, if we make a mistake, we can usually turn it into something anyways and make it work. Like one time, we turned spaghetti sauce failure into tomato soup. Cooking is like an art, but baking, it's super precise, like a science. Hang on, I feel an experiment. Yes, a musical experiment. In my shaker. I can bake an awesome caker. A pinch of pepper, a dash of salt. I must measure without a fault. Forgot the meat, no need to worry. No baking soda, I'm going blurry. Instead, I made a Zoe surprise. Ha! But my soup light, it just won't rise. They say that cooking is an art. Baking's like science, just look at my chart. I use any ingredients I have on hand. Hey, I can do this cool handstand. Together we can make a delicious meal. Okay, my friend, you got a deal. You got a deal. You got a deal. <laughs> you got a deal. Well, thanks, Erica. I can't wait to taste the cake later. I'm making dough for my mini party pizzas. I hope this experiment works too. Check this out. I let this dough sit for a few hours, and now it's double the size of this one. It's because I put yeast in the dough. And yeast makes things like pizza dough and bread rise. But I'm kind of wondering the same thing as Max. If yeast expands in bread, can it expand in your body? Mm. <laughs> ah, me big, me full of yeast. That's scary, but I know someone who can answer the question. He's got all the info on how yeast makes things grow. Please welcome my very special guest, Shakib Rahman. Hi, Zoe. Shakib. <laughs> I ate bread with way too much yeast in it. Wait, what? <laughs> Kidding! <sighs> so, Shakib, what exactly is yeast? It's a living thing, like a plant or an animal. Yeast is a kind of fungus that eats sugar and starch. When it's activated by heat, the yeast eats the sugar and basically farts out carbon dioxide gas. That's what creates the little pockets of air in the dough that make it expand. But the yeast eventually dies from the heat of baking. Also, the acid in our stomach is so strong that it ends up killing the yeast before it can fart out any carbon dioxide. That's why if you eat any bread, you don't get all gassy afterwards. Oh, you. But what's the difference between yeast and baking soda we use in our cakes? Baking soda produces a chemical reaction. It's very, very fast. Oh, so that's why Erica said to put the cake batter in the oven right away after we added the baking soda. Yeah, that's right. You had to get those air bubbles trapped in the cake before they escaped. Yeast, unlike baking soda, is a living thing. It produces its carbon dioxide very, very slowly. So that's why my pizza dough didn't rise so fast. Exactly. Do you want to try another experiment where we can make some chemicals rise? Yeah. I've got exploding elephant toothpaste here. Cool. We're using chemicals, and this experiment is going to create a lot of heat. Safety goggles, safety gloves, check. The first thing I'm going to do is add some hydrogen peroxide. So you have to be very careful with this stuff, which is why we have our safety gear on. Excellent. Do you want to add the dish soap for me, Zoe? One, two, three. I'm going to add blue food coloring here. Now you've got to add the last ingredient, special chemical X, potassium iodide. Can you see all the steam coming out of there, Zoe? Yeah, I do. Our hydrogen peroxide turned into water, which turned into steam because of all of the heat we're generating, and it also turned into oxygen. 
and our oxygen got trapped by all of the dish soap, which is why we have all of this nice foamy mess here. <laughs> That's so cool. It really does look like a giant tube of toothpaste that an elephant would use. That's right, but don't try this at home without an adult's help. That reminds me of another question I got from Leah. What's an easy experiment I can make in my kitchen to make things puff up? Well, Leah, some of my friends did a little bit of experimenting. The experiment! Hi, Adriana. Hi, Jonah. Hi. Hi. Are you going to amaze me with a puffy experiment? Yeah, we will. We have our bottle ready for the experiment. I'm gonna put the funnel in. And then I'm gonna put some baking soda inside of the bottle. Just gotta make sure it all goes down. Next, I'm gonna put some vinegar in the bottle. I gotta be ready with the glove because I gotta get it on super quick. Check that out, it's like a ghost hand. A ghost hand? Cool! <laughs> The chemical reaction between the baking soda and the vinegar created bubbles of carbon dioxide gas that are blowing up the glove. Let's compare with the next experiment. This one uses yeast with sugar and water. Let's begin. Put the funnel in. Now we do the water. water. Next, I'm going to add the sugar. Now I'm going to add the yeast. And now, we shake it. Now let's get the balloon. Nothing's puffing up yet. This experiment with yeast is much slower. Now we wait. Wow, it's just like when yeast farts out gas and makes bread puff up. The yeast is eating up all the sugar and it keeps farting out gas. It took 10 minutes to puff up, but it was worth the wait. Thanks for the cool experiments. Bye, Zoe. If I waited for yeast to blow up all my party balloons, I would have to wait a while. I'm gonna turn this place into Party Central. Hey, speaking of transforming something, Liat had another question about experiments you can do in your kitchen. Could you turn food into something completely different? Great question, Liat. Shakib has a magic experiment up his sleeve. Go ahead, Shakib. That's right, Zoe. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some potatoes and turn them into a really cool experiment. The first thing I had to do was I had to take my potatoes, cut them up, and then boil them in water, and then get rid of the water, so I ended up with my potato starch. Now, if you don't have an adult to help you, you can just go to the store and get potato starch from there. The next thing we have to do is take this potato starch, combine it with some tonic water. Mixing a little bit of this tonic water with the potato starch will give us the start of our cool experiment. Now, because this is a little bit messy, I'm gonna put on some gloves and mix this all together. It does this weird thing. It starts to form a solid. But that solid, when I let go of it, starts to flow like a liquid. This is something we call a non-Newtonian fluid. If I squeeze it hard again, you can see that it forms a solid, but by letting go of the pressure, we get a nice liquid that starts to flow again. Here's the magic part. If I turn off the light, something really cool happens. Using a black light, which gives off ultraviolet light, you can see that our potato goo now glows in the dark. The reason for that is the tonic water that we added earlier has a special chemical in it. It's called quinine. Quinine is something that glows when you put it in ultraviolet light. And that's our magic mud experiment. Wow, that magic mud can't decide if it wants to be solid or liquid. <laughs> it's crazy it could be both. And that gives me an idea for... On Team Solid, we have Daniel and Lex. Whoa! <laughs> and on Team Liquid, we have Veronica and Fabiola. <laughs> In today's challenge, you're actually gonna be both liquid and solid. Well, the magic mud you're going to be using is both. In each pot, I filled it with a bunch of items that have to do with cake. The team with the most items at the end of the challenge wins. Go! It's a pretty sticky challenge. <laughs> uh, Team Liquid has two. Oh. Team Solid has one right now. Team Liquid is in the lead at three. Team Solid has two. Oh, Team Solid's catching up. I got one. <laughs> Team Liquid has five. Uh, Team so Solid has four. Five. So Team Liquid has six. Oh. Team Solid has to keep digging if they oh. want to catch up. They're trying to go fast, but it doesn't work because that magic mud gets really hard. 
Ugh. Solid has eight. Oh, Team oh, Solid's in the lead right now, guys. Oh, 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 oh. So good. And they're at nine. Okay. Go, go, go. Oh, Team Liquid back on oh, top. That was fast. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. okay, time's up. You guys have 12. And Team Solid, you guys have 11. So that means we have a winner. Team Liquid, you win. <laughs> good job, guys. Good job, guys. Thanks. So what was the stickiest part? The magic mud. Because you think you have an object, but you, you really don't. don't. Yeah. The stickiest part is that I can't get my hands out. <laughs> well, thanks, guys, for being on my show. You're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. Do I bring this box with me? It's stuck if you to have me. to. It's stuck to me like cement. <laughs> that was awesome. And it made me dream about birthday cake and a big glass of... Oh, we! This milk went bad. Ugh. It's like it's an experiment on its own. Ugh. That reminds me of a question I got from Anastasia. Why does the milk get disgusting and chunky when you leave it on the counter for a long time? She'll tell us why it gets lumpy, because bad milk sure makes us grumpy. Please welcome bacteria investigator Maya Hay. Hey, Zoe. Hi, Maya. I brought you some food. Mmm, food. <coughs> Yum. Do you see how the food is starting to change color and that there's some slime and fuzz developing on top? Yeah. That's because the food is starting to break down from bacteria. And the same thing happens with the milk. When milk breaks down, it gets clumpy like this. That's gross. Bacteria is in all foods. It's everywhere, actually, so this is totally normal. The bacteria take the natural sugar that are in milk and they make waste. But that bacteria poop is really acidic and that reacts with the milk. When the milk starts to break down, it starts to get clumpy and it curdles just like that. Now, check this out. I have some of this bacteria that I grew on a Petri plate. Do you see any on this? No. That's because I only put it on this morning, so they haven't had a chance to grow yet. But check this out. Do you see any there? Yeah. So, how many do you think are in that Petri plate? 500. Keep going. 10,000? Keep going. A million? There are billions in this tiny Petri plate. Billions? That's like the entire population of the world. Imagine that in a glass of milk. Yay. You're gonna make my head explode. <laughs> Slow your roll, bacteria. I found out there's a way to do that. Bacteria move a lot more slowly in a cold place, so they don't multiply into billions as fast. That's why keeping milk and food in the fridge makes it last longer. There's another way to preserve milk, and that's to use the help of bacteria. Here's what we're gonna do. This is some milk. And then what I want you to do is add this starter culture. It's basically a special mix of bacteria. I want you to add two tablespoons to it. So these are good bacteria, not the kind that can make you sick. Exactly. Two. Great, now give it a mix. What happens when we mix it? So what mixing it does is it introduces the bacteria to all of those sugars, and then when you wait 12 to 18 hours later, it's gonna turn into yogurt like this. That's crazy. So how does it do that? It's called fermentation. Basically, the bacteria took the milk sugars and made it into an acid, and that acid reacted with the milk, and it thickened it just like this. Do you wanna try? Yeah. Thanks. Now that's delicious. Thanks, Maya. You're welcome. It's pretty amazing there's good bacteria that we can use to make food, and then there's bad bacteria that can make us sick. There was a time when people weren't so sure what caused sickness. <laughs> Flat Earth Corner! The evil wind is blowing. I must not breathe in the vapor. It will strike me down with the deadly cholera, poisonous wind, and disgusting smell. 
Why must you curse us with your evil stink? I cannot catch the disease. I must not breathe in the wind. <coughs> Catching a deadly disease from the wind? About 200 years ago, that's what people thought. In 19th century England, there was a huge outbreak of a deadly disease called cholera. A whole lot of people died from it because it couldn't be controlled. Back then, they thought it was caused by mysterious clouds of air filled with bits of rotting things and smelling gases. But a doctor named John Snow found something out. He discovered that city drinking water from some of the pumps were dirty and infected. They didn't have good sewers like we have today. So it wasn't because of something they were breathing, it was because of something they were drinking. I'm glad we know so much about bacteria today. I'm also glad I didn't drink that spoiled milk before. Oh yeah, party time is getting closer. My friends and I love chicken wings, so these will be a big hit. Oh, that reminds me. Uh-oh, do try this at home. I put this chicken bone in some vinegar about a week ago. Check this out. You have to rinse it off and watch. A rubber chicken bone. The vinegar dissolves a mineral called calcium, which is what makes bones hard. Without the calcium, what's left is just this soft bone. Bye, guys! Hi! Thank you! Thank you. <laughs> wow, our cake looks delicious. Mm. It was definitely a successful experiment. I think I'm ready to answer the question that started off the show. What type of experiments can you do in your kitchen? Well, Maya, the big answer is, drum roll please. There is no limit. Today we did experiments that used all different kinds of science, like chemistry, physics, and biology. Using kitchen ingredients, some of them were even good to eat. You can do tons of kitchen experiments with really basic stuff. The kitchen is our lab and we're the scientists. But here's my favorite kitchen experiment. Let's find out if the cake is delicious. Yeah! This is good. I love experiments. Mm. 